Uh, welcome everyone to the Center for European Studies remote um, and to the seminar on the state of democracy and uh, future research. Uh, we have a big audience today. My name is uh, Grzegorz Ekert uh, and together with Professor Daniel Ziblat, uh, we are co-conveners of the seminar. Uh, the seminar is designed as the collaborative project with four other institutions. Uh, and those other institutions are the Transformation of Democracy Unit at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, uh, Democracy Institute at Central European University in Budapest, uh, Center for Studies of Democracy, Civil Society, Political Elites at the Collegium Civitas in Warsaw, and SNN Agora Institute at John Hopkins University. I would really like to thank colleagues from these institutions uh, for the readiness to uh, join our project. We all share the sense uh, that today democracy is under siege, uh, not only in uh, isolated places, but all over the world, including uh, the country uh, uh, we are uh, in. And it is our duty uh, to reflect on the causes of uh, democratic problems uh, or democracy problems and on the future of democratic uh, politics. Uh, uh, these are the main goals of, uh, of that seminar uh, and uh, of that project. We also want to uh, have impact on the emerging research agendas uh, in the field of democracy studies. Uh, before I ask uh, Daniel to introduce our today's speakers, I would like to thank CS staff and especially Vasilis, Laura, Gila and Michael for the effort to launch uh, the seminar. Uh, so, Daniel, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you, Jay Gorsh, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm Daniel Ziblatt, and um, Jay Gorsh and I are really happy to have this opportunity to launch this series. This is the first of what we hope to be a series of meetings over the, at least the next year and beyond uh, engaging across the Atlantic. Um, so today I have the pleasure of introducing the four speakers. They're each going to speak for 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up for a broader discussion. So I just wanna briefly uh, uh, mention, describe each of our panelists. We really have assembled a great group of scholars who approach the topic of democracy from many different together collectively give us, a, will give us, I think a great picture of where we are and how uh, to think about the study of democracy. So our first speaker today will be uh, Sherry Berman who's a professor of political science at Barnard College, Columbia. Uh, her research interests uh, include European history, politics, the development of democracy, She's written uh, many wonderful books and articles, and she's a real uh, frequent participant in discussions about current events from the perspective of a kind of a historical angle. Uh, her most recent book is Democracy and Dictatorship from the Anshan Regime to the Present Day, a monumental big book on the development of democracy over a long time period. Um, our second speaker today will be Wolfgang Merkel, who's the Director Emeritus of the Democracy and Democratization Research Program at the Wissenschaftszentrum Berlin, where he was the director for uh, 15 years. He also uh, was a professor emeritus at, is a professor emeritus at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, his books, many books uh, inc include, cover a whole range of topics on the concept of embedded democracy uh, is one of kind of his big contributions to the study of democracy. A recent publication from Wolfgang is The Struggle Over Borders, Cosmopolitanism and Communitarianism. Uh, our third uh, speaker today is Yasha Munk, um, who is Associate Professor of the Practice of International Affairs at the School of the SICE at Johns Hopkins and a Senior Fellow at the SNF Agora Institute. Uh, he's uh, the author of several books, including his most recent book, The People Versus Democracy, Why Our Freedom is in Danger and How to Save It, which has been translated into 10 languages of last count and recognized as one of the best books 2018 by the Financial Times. Um, so we're very happy to have Yasha with us today as well. And then finally, our fourth speaker is Pippa Norris, who's the Paul McGuire Lecturer in Comparative Politics at the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, where she has taught for, for many years. She's also a professor at the University of Sydney. Uh, she's an author of many, many books. And here with this distinguished um, group of scholars, I'm really looking forward to hearing what, um, what they have to say. Um, I'll start off, you know, with the sort of, um, initial statement that you guys made, which is it is extremely easy to be gloomy about democracy today to sort of focus on its um, being under siege. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying I think some of this may be colored by the fact that most of the folks um, here 
um, are from um, uh, Europe and the United States. And I think from those vantage points, the situation does look um, particularly glim, I mean, or rather glum. Um, I think from a historical perspective, which is the perspective that um, I'm most comfortable with, um, what we're seeing today is not um, generally all that surprising. The backsliding that we have seen over the past years is um, historically not unprecedented. It's less than the backsliding that occurred um, during previous waves. The numbers of democracies, as I know my colleagues will probably attest, still remains um, relatively high, the high point of, um, I think sort of the democratic wave being between about 2005 and 2010. Um, and also as some of my colleagues have written, a lot of the democracies that made transitions during the late 20th and 21st century, we probably would not have using our sort of standard theoretical and historical frameworks expected to have been very successful. They lacked some of the prerequisites that political scientists often associate with successful democracy. They had very little previous experience with democracy and therefore had um, you know, not deeply embedded norms and institutions that we associated with well-functioning democracy. So to some degree, I think our gloom today is a sort of flip side of the euphoria that we had after you know, 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union when there was no sort of avatar of dictatorship, no country or set of countries that were championing a sort of different model from liberal capitalist democracy. And so I think we're to some degree coming down from a high that was um, a high of a very um, particular moment. And as that you know, particular moment shifted and um, the avatars of liberal democracy began to sort of decline in some ways and other countries, I would say most notably China, um, became even more seemingly successful and prominent, it's not surprising, again, just sort of from a global perspective that there has been, you know, a sort of shift in the winds. So to some degree, I think some of the backsliding was predictable, if not predicted, to use a kind of quippy phrase. I think where there have been unanticipated problems would be precisely in the countries where most, although not all of us are situated, that is to say in Western Europe and the United States. Um, here we kind, as Yasha and others have written, we kind of expected that democracy was consolidated and by consolidated, we meant not in danger of backsliding. Um, and so I think we did not have good sort of theoretical frameworks for understanding the kinds of problems that these countries are facing today. Um, and the second part of this panel, of the second charge we had for this panel was sort of to think a little bit about where scholars might be able to contribute to expanding our knowledge base going forward. Um, and here, not surprisingly, I think that um, there's been great comparative work, but that further comparative work might be helpful. Um, with regards to understanding why we've seen this backsliding in countries that we saw were consolidated, I think comparative work between Scholars who use different kinds of approaches would be helpful. Um, someone like Pippa Norris, for instance, who has done great work on helping us understand why citizens' attitudes have changed and how those changing attitudes might lead them to become dissatisfied with democracy, dissatisfied with mainstream parties, dissatisfied with the establishment, what folks in the um, social sciences call demand side or bottom up explanations or even behavioral type of explanations, right? So we have a lot of good research on what's been going on with citizen attitudes. We also have a lot of good research that comes from the supply side or top down or an institutionalist perspective. This kind of research looks at what parties themselves do, what political actors themselves do to kind of change the political dynamics of particular countries from a Europeanist background, which is the part of the world that I know best. There's been some really interesting work, for example, on how shifts in conservative parties away from conservative positions on cultural issues, on national identity issues, opened up a space for right-wing populists. There's been some work by myself and many others on how shifts by center-left parties away from um, uh, particular economic profiles and de-emphasis on class identities also um, opened up a space for 
right wing populist parties to kind of move in and capture voters who were um, perhaps more progressive on economic issues, but conservative on social and cultural ones. There's also been work on populist parties themselves, right wing populist parties themselves on how they've shifted their profiles to capture more voters and in some places even political power. So there's been some work again on both how citizens have changed and how parties and political actors have changed in ways that have, again, opened up possibilities for democratic decay and backsliding. There's also, I think, been a lot of interesting work, but more that could be done um, comparing different cases or regions of the world. There's more interaction now than ever before, I think, between scholars studying the United States and scholars studying Europe as well as other parts of the world. And here in particular, being a recent um, uh, consumer of the Americanist literature, I'm struck by um, how little Americanists, particularly in the past, considered um, how similar and in some ways different the United States is from other advanced industrial nations. Many of the things, for instance, that folks attribute to the rise of Trumpism in the United States, um, racial animosity, um, high levels of inequality, things like that, surely are um, critical features of the American scene, but they don't exist in the same ways in Europe. And yet we've seen some similar trends. And so thinking more carefully about how these things play out would be um, helpful. And of course, comparisons between the advanced industrial world and Latin America and other regions where populism has been a longstanding problem has also been um, you know, quite fruitful and I would say of relatively recent um, nature. Um, let me, because um, I don't want to take up too much time, let me end by suggesting um, that where some places where I think more research might be fruitful. Um, so I think there's been a lot of good work now on the origins or the reasons for um, populism and democratic decay in different parts of the world. Um, where I think there's been less research and where I think we know less is how to fight these things. That is to say, how to push back against these trends. And here, when I look at the literature briefly, I see two things, um, one of which is very general and one of which is um, sort of specific. The general thing, um, and this point has been raised by a number of scholars, perhaps most notably by one of Yasha's colleagues, Roberta Foa and his colleagues at the Cambridge Center for the Future of Democracy. Um, they came out recently with a report on democratic dissatisfaction, which made clear that for most citizens, dissatisfaction with democracy, um, the dissatisfaction with the establishment is rooted in real problems. That is to say, they feel that democracy, mainstream parties have not done a very good job in dealing with the real challenges their countries face. That is to say, Democratic dissatisfaction is rooted not in the sort of malaise that characterizes a lot of intellectuals who look at democracy, but in an actual frustration with real existing problems, which seems to indicate um, that if these problems were actually dealt with, that democratic dissatisfaction would decline. And I think an indirect sort of um, confirmation of that is I personally cannot think of any quote unquote consolidated democracy that has ever collapsed without being accompanied by, again, some really objective um, objective problems, crises, yada, yada, yada. Um, the more specific thing that I've seen in the literature on this seems to indicate that one thing that really hinders the fight against democratic decay is that when opposition to um, proto-authoritarians fractures, that is to say when the opponents of the existing, again, uh, uh, authoritarian politician or authoritarian minded parties, when that opposition fractures, when it's not unified around the primary goal of fighting back the dictatorial threat, that it is much easier for whatever, populism, pseudo authoritarianism to win out. Um, I think that's an important point and certainly watching what's going on in the United States, you know, makes that, um, makes the resonance or relevance of that clear but I haven't been able to find many other findings, many other well-established or significant areas of scholarship on you know, ways of fighting back these trends. And so I would end by saying that this is someplace I think where we still potentially have a lot to learn and where comparative scholars on democracy um, might have something 
um, not only theoretically, but practically useful to contribute. Thank you. Ooh. Sorry, Daniel, we, we couldn't hear you. Um, We'd like to turn it over to Wolfgang. Wolfgang is next. Okay, thank you very much. It was the last minute that I changed the topic of my presentation here. Uh, now the title is Science, Morale and Democracy. That means that I'm looking at the problem we are discussing here through very specific lenses. As Sherry and before Chagosh has pointed out, there is a worldwide consensus or majority of democracy scholars uh, that we are witnessing a decline of democracy. Nevertheless, the theoretical debate is still undecided how to conceptualize these processes. There is an increasing stock of terms such as decline, decay, deconsolidation, de-democratization, erosion, autocratization, and so forth. But these are mostly mere terms and they are not theoretical concepts. And the opposite is true for the variety of notions uh, we used to hear in order to describe the results, not the processes, the results of this decline, such as post-democracy, simulative democracy, illiberal democracy, hybrid regimes, guided democracy, etc. There is a kind of theoretical surplus accompanied by analytical deficits. What we need as comparativists uh, are analytically usable theories on the one side and theoretically informed empirical research on the other side. And why do we need this? I think we should uh, move more courageously from description to causality in our analyses. So the crucial question then would be what drives the erosion of democracy? We have heard something from uh, Sherry, uh, what strengthens its resilience, which are the remote and which are the immediate causes for it? and are endogenous factors more relevant or exogenous uh, causes? Do they affect the micro, meso, or macro level of democratic regimes? And how are these levels of political behavior, intermediary organizations, and polity institutions connected? But as I have pointed out at the beginning, I want to put my finger on a very specific deficit of our knowledge on de-democratization. That means what impact do the new types of exogenous crisis have on democracy? What do I mean by uh, new types of crisis? I have three examples in mind. The first one, migration, then global warming, and then pandemics. These, are, these three crises are different from the classical economic crisis, breakdown of political regimes, military intervention. And there are at least three factors which make them distinct from these other crises. First, the moralization of politics, second, a new role of science, and third, governance by rational fear. Uh, do the new crisis leave undemocratic sediments which tend to accumulate and erode even well-established democracies from within? Uh, after the crisis have already ended. My hypothesis is clear, yes, they do. Recurrent states of exception as we have seen it in the past, 
change the attitudes and behavior of political elites, but also of citizens. They polarize society, they shift, and I think this is quite important, they shift democratic legitimacy from input to output. They change even legal norms to the advantage of the executive. They blur lines of accountability and they accelerate the already ongoing de-parliamentarization of our democracies. I will focus in the remaining time on four points. Shift from input to output, science as, allow me this term, as a new philosopher king in democracy. Third, moralization of politics lead to polarization of society. And the question, will the responses, responses to COVID-19 uh, emergency policy become a blueprint for future crisis? Shift from input uh, to output. In times of crisis, there is a shift from input. Here I mean participation, throughput, decision-making to output. And this shift is driven by governments and the positive reception by the demos who considers the overcoming of the crisis as much more important than let's say constitutional correct decision-making. And the old definition we have taught our students of democracy as a political regime always has been there are institutions and rules which are a priori fixed and the results are contingent. And this sequence is threatened to reverse these times. The outcome is fixed and the institutional procedures become contingent. This is not a conspiracy by Machiavellian elites it is more a demand by the citizen, by, so to say, the will of the people. The second point, is science becoming now a new philosopher king in our democracies? No doubt in complex crises such as pandemics or global warming, political elites have to rely on cutting edge research clashes between scientific knowledge and political representation or institutional rules seem to be inevitable. Climate activists are already indolent with respect to this democratic dilemma. You hear quite often, science has told us. We only have to implement what science tell us is their firm conviction and uh, sometimes impatient demand. That's what I would call democracy by epistemic legitimation. Science trumps democratic rules. Third point, does moralization of politics lead to a polarization of society? Moralization of politics means, among others, the introduction of a binary code, lie or truth, moral or amoral, reason or conspiracy. Somebody who does not believe in climate change or the deadly risk of COVID-19 or the human cost uh, of migration is a climate and corona denier or an inhuman being who does not fulfill the humanitarian task of saving a refugee. Needless to say, I don't want to defend these kind of positions. They are normat normatively quite distant to my thinking. But what moralization does is they transform political opponents in enemies. Left liberal anti-Schmidtians unintendedly follow a kind of Schmidtian uh, script of establishing 
a friend and foe relationship as the core of the political. And such an understanding of the political will further polarize our societies. It will delegitimize dissent and denounce compromises as political treason. Last point, will COVID-19 emergency policy become a blueprint for a future crisis? What we have seen is the following. The uh, COVID crisis was the hour of the executive, of science, and by the way, of the nation state as well. The parliament was sidelined as an ex post rubber stamp institution and in an uncharted territory of frightening uncertainty. This is a very important term in this context of frightening uncertainty, responsible politicians wow, are risk avoider and yeah, tend to decide pro-security. Yeah. Uh, pro Populist politicians are exceptions. Security trumps liberty. And ironically, if you look to the debates, ironically, semi-democratic right-wing populists uh, can distinguish themselves, and Cherry pointed to a similar point, as the advocates of freedom, the custodians of constitution and democracy. This was an empty space in the debate. Complex crisis, to end my presentation, complex crisis of the 21st century will challenge liberal democracy. And again, it is not conspiracy of political elites. It is the logic of those crises and the demand of the demos for solving problems as soon as possible and sometimes even at each uh, democratic costs. If negative legacies of recurring crises will pile up, illiberal sentiment, sentiments layer by layer they crowd out, crowd out the liberal elements of our democracy. Populist reaction to that kind of epistemic technocratic mode of governance may deepen the divide between the reasonable and the deniers, the winners and the losers, cosmopolitans and nationalists, not good use for democracy. Thank you, Wolfgang Ayasha. I'm honored to be your audio just worked, Dan. This is uh, yes. Well, I'm I'm keeping it brief because I'm afraid of my voice. <laughs> uh, well, can I just say, Jay Gorsh, if I in the future, if I'm take over, if I'm sorry, yeah, sure. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Yasha, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, listen, I uh, I'm honored to speak at, at at this event. I'm really excited for the seminar series. I think it's a wonderful idea that uh, uh, Jagosh and Dan and the CS had, and and I think it will hopefully. Uh, really push forward our thinking in this area. And I'm always nostalgic for the times I spent in the lovely building that serves as the background for uh, Jagosh's uh, face. Um, I'll try and keep it brief. I, I have two sort of, I guess we have a double brief, right? We have a brief to talk a little bit about the state of democracy around the world, and then a brief uh, to talk about uh, the state of our knowledge of and study of democracy. Um, uh, so I'll start with the first and then move to the second. Um, it strikes me that we haven't very much mentioned uh, the recent American election. And I think it really is uh, an important event. Um, and I'm much more optimistic about what it uh, says about this political moment in the next few years than some of my colleagues. Um, I have the impression that there was a desire, no doubt fueled by the uh, opinion polls, to see this sort of definitive renunciation of populists and populism. Uh, that, you know, we were going to get a rejection of Trumpism, which has made it clear that it had no supporters anymore and it was going to be gone from a political landscape. Um, I think there was a naive hope and belief when you look around the world, uh, populists actually tend to stay in power much longer than non-populists. As I've shown in some work, that on average, they stay in power for over 10 years, whereas non-populist governments tend to stay in power for about 3.4 years, I believe. Um, even when they leave office, they often come back after a period of being sort of uh, 
thrown out of a political system, of their support is turning on them as they start to be dissatisfied with other elements uh, of a political system that led to a rise anyway, uh, the same figures or the handpicked successors often sort of surge back. So the, this election was never going to be end of Trump and Trumpism, and the result makes clear that it isn't. Nevertheless, it is in the long war that I think liberal democracy is, is facing with this serious internal threat of authoritarian populism, by far and away the largest victory, the largest one battle that we've seen so far. And I think we should uh, emphasize that and take courage from it. I also think that the last four years show something else very interesting, which is that Francis Fukuyama in January 2017 said that Trump was going to be a great <laughs> experiment, but as citizens we may bemoan, but as political scientists, social scientists, we should look forward to with excitement um, of whether liberal democracies are, are, are governed by the rule of men or the rule of uh, laws, which is to say, uh, whether the institutions are easily able to constrain an uh, authoritarian power like Donald Trump. And I think there, uh, the, the, the results are somewhat mixed. I mean, Donald Trump, first of all, has not been as pure a national experiment as Fukuyama anticipated, because frankly, he's been much less competent and much less disciplined and much less strategic than many other authoritarian populists. And so we should realize that we were dealing with an attenuated version of the virus to use a pandemic metaphor. Um, but even so, we've seen him uh, inflict serious damage. We have seen the extent to which the Republican Party still to this day uh, has been captured by him in a kind of Stockholm syndrome. Uh, we have seen um, uh, the extent to which many independent institutions, including the FBI and the Department of Justice, um, have been uh, influenced politically. We have seen how easy it is to fire inspectors general and other key staff that are supposed to ensure the objective, uh, impartial uh, uh, functioning of key democratic institutions. All of that is very, very worrying. It shows us that clearly, to some extent, liberal democracies cannot prevent the rule of men. Um, but at the same time, uh, we are also seeing a president who's denying the outcome of an election, making claims of voter fraud, would clearly like to stay in power if he could. And despite all of the depressingness of the last few weeks, it's not going to work. The elections were carried out relatively fairly. Um, uh, the army is not going to listen to Donald Trump on the 20th of January uh, 2021 at 12.01 p.m. It will naturally recognize the 46th president of the United States as its legitimate, legitimate commander in chief. Um, uh, you know, even the media have actually acted somewhat responsibly. I mean, Fox News has this bizarre role where the commentators come on and Paddle bullshit, but then actually the news anchors call Arizona for Joe Biden earlier than anybody else and are sort of pushing that back. So, so there's some amount of democratic resilience here. And I think it's interesting to study and understand why that is. What is it about the US that has made it, um, put it in a position to survive this a little bit better than, uh, than other places? So, uh, just in terms of the outlook of where we are of democracy, um, a number of the biggest democracies around the world continue to be ruled by authoritarian populists. It is absolutely possible that Trumpism will come roaring back in 2024, perhaps in smarter and more disciplined form. The war is not over, but we have seen in the last years that some of the most established democracies can uh, uh, hold off authoritarian populists even if they were in power, but it is possible for the opposition uh, to throw those people out of office when they are disciplined and run a relatively good campaign. Uh, the most powerful country in the world is once again going to uh, uh, try to encourage movements towards democracy rather than cheerleading the perpetrators of democratic backsliding. Um, the war is far from over, but it's looking a lot more cheerful and a lot more sunny right now than it was a few months ago. Um, so with that, let me um, transition to some thoughts about uh, research on populism. I think there's been a huge blossoming of research on populism, obviously, over the last four or five years. Um, social scientists rarely anticipate the headlines, but they certainly um, are able to deepen uh, them uh, once uh, uh, the, the headlines take the lead. Um, a lot of people have moved towards the study of populism and come up with some uh, really important insights about the sort of broad social scientific questions of 
what is populism? What are some of the causes of its rise? Um, you know, what are uh, the drivers of demand for populism, but also, you know, what constraints the supply of populism and how does the model of populism we now have allow other people to emulate it and so on and so forth. These are all uh, very important. I do worry though that to some extent, uh, this knowledge is less useful than it might be. It's not that we shouldn't be asking those questions and it's not that it's not valuable to have answered those questions, but there's a set of somewhat more specific policy adjacent questions that I keep being asked when I speak to uh, politicians, policymakers, philanthropists, foreign policymakers and other kinds of audiences that frankly we don't have great answers to. These, these questions may be of less theoretical interest um, uh, they may push us into areas where some of our methods don't work as easily, but I think that uh, they are very, very important for us to answer if we are going to win this uh, uh, battle against authoritarian populism. So here's just four or five of those that I thought of the top of my head, um, but perhaps they can serve as a model for other kinds as well. So one, one question uh, is, which countries are more or less resilient to populism and why? If it appears right now that the United States has turned out to be more resilient than Hungary, for example, is that because the United States is more affluent? Is it because its democracy is of longer standing? Is it because the system is much more federal? And so for example, it's much harder to influence uh, elections in corrupt electoral systems. Um, now why is it that some countries that have experienced authoritarian populists have, have, have preserved the system long enough to be able to get rid of them and other countries haven't. Uh, that's probably the broadest level of generality. The second is, what campaign strategies do and don't work? Is there something that uh, Imamolu, the new uh, mayor of Istanbul, and Joe Biden have in common? And if they have something in common, is that a model that other politicians uh, in India and Brazil and elsewhere may choose to emulate? Um, uh, what mistakes did populist uh, opponents who uh, seem to have a shot of winning an election make, uh, that it explains why, for example, uh, in, in Poland in the end, um, uh, Kamarowski, the president, was re-elected. Um, uh, so Andrzej Duda uh, was re-elected. Um, so, so, so can we gain any insights about what kind of campaigns and what kind of rhetoric uh, works against populists who are in power? Uh, another question, what's the role of civil society in democratic resilience? And how can this inform philanthropic giving? Uh, we've seen a whole uh, lot of efforts in the United States for the last four or five years of trying to contain uh, uh, the damage that Donald Trump is doing. Um, I think all of us who are on this call, are, uh, at least the, the Americans, are involved in this in one form or another, um, uh, have advised some of these organizations in formal or informal ways. Uh, well, what of that actually worked and what of that didn't work? And if you want to either export that model to a place like Poland, or you want to ensure that if uh, Trumpism 2.0 comes to the country and is more powerful, um, what kind of playbook should we follow? Is there a playbook to be devised? Um, another question is, uh, uh, you know, okay, fine. We've identified a lot of the long-term structural drivers of uh, populism. And I think Sherry spoke very eloquently to that. Um, but what policies can actually address those and what, what are those policies are feasible to put in place? Um, as we know from other policy areas, it's easy, for example, to study the, the sort of causes of crime, but that doesn't necessarily give you a set of tools you need uh, to figure out how to actually contain and reduce crime. So fine, we have an increasingly sophisticated literature about what causes populism with some sort of stale debates and uh, some less stale insights. Um, but, but, but let's take the extra step to think about what that means for the policies we could push for that we actually have some hope of implementing. Um, and finally, uh, what can countries and in international organizations do uh, to uh, contain democratic backsliding? Um, you know, uh, Dan Kalman and others have shown very, very well, I think, the ways in which the European Union doesn't just fail to stop democratic backsliding in some of its member countries, it may actually facilitate and encourage it inadvertently in places like Poland and Hungary. Uh, but what would it look like for an entity like the United 
the right the European Union or the United Nations or NATO or all of us other organizations um, to hold member states accountable in a way that really provides this incentive to democratic backsliding. And what role can countries, whether it's Germany or France, or, or now hopefully a few months, hence the United States, that have uh, the will and the incentive to uh, uh, encourage democratic resilience do in order to uh, uh, you know, provide disincentives for some of those governments from going through with rule of law violations, provide incentives for them to get back on the right path um, and, uh, and help domestic opposition movements uh, have good arguments uh, for, for why it's in their country's interest to uh, uh, preserve the rule of law and the separation of powers. Um, so those are just some areas of potential research. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I, I hope that this, this great collaboration between different institutions around the world is going to be able to answer some of these questions or at least push us to uh, think about some of these questions. Um, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Yasha. Um, our final speaker is Pippa Norris. And Pippa, you can share your screen, I think. I'm going to share. So hopefully you can now see that works. some of my slides. So I'd like to thank you very much at Centre for European Studies. It's brilliant. And I think this is a good initiative, as Yasha said. I'd love to say hello to all my colleagues and the friends which we have. And in particular to talk about today, building on what Yasha has said, the US elections. It's the elephant in the room. It's the event which is in everybody's mind. The transition crisis, about which I'm going to be less optimistic than Yasha has, and the implications for American democracy. And I think this is going to give a case about what's going on with lessons that we can understand in many parts of the world. So first I'd like to just mention the theoretical framework. How do we understand democratic breakdown or backsliding? And then I'm going to talk about five potential risks, which I think are there. And even though there is probably going to be a Biden presidency, nevertheless, the risks are substantial, ranging from more minor risks of, I think, political administration through to serious risks in terms of the political culture. And then the conclusions, what does this mean? We're living through this crisis. And so is it really going to be a legitimacy crisis or is it going to be a temporary downturn that can be moved back under Biden? So what are the theories? Well, we all know the literature, it's enormous and all of our colleagues on this have really contributed in great ways. But again, as many people have said, Wolfgang emphasized that our concepts are somewhat vague and contradictory or at least not, not crystal clear. And the drivers of what's going on I think haven't yet been established. And I go back to the work of Linz and Stefan as our classics. So the breakdown of democratic regimes as a broad framework. What does it mean to have democracies backsliding or breaking down rather like a failed state? Institutionally, it was argued in the 1970s when there was a previous wave of decline, some major actors failed to observe basic democratic principles, norms of behavior and practices. And again, the work of our colleagues has emphasized that democratic norms, soft democratic norms, the things we take for granted are fundamental. Culturally, it means that the overwhelming majority of the public no longer has faith in the principles, the ideals, the norms of liberal democracy, that it's the best form of government. They might be tempted by other types, such as strongman rule. Behaviorally, there have to be certain groups who actively seek to overthrow the regime, according to Linson Stefan's view. That I think is the area which is somewhat murky and we know less about. And then I'd add a fourth condition, constitutionally, if there are crises in the institutions, formal and informal, the system has to be able to respond, it has to be able to reform itself, it has to be able to renew democracy. And if it lacks that capacity, if there's gridlock and stalemate, then any remedies won't work. And I think we know quite a lot about each of these. So institutionally, we have, for example, the varieties of democracy project, which has looked at trends over time for many, many, many centuries, suggesting that there has been a small modest decline, particularly in electoral democracies, not so much in most liberal democracies, but particularly in certain institutions like freedom of the press. Culturally, we have sources like the seventh wave of the World Value Survey, European Value Survey, just released over a hundred countries where we can document attitudes towards democracy as an ideal and practice and things like trust. Behaviorally, we have less systematic work, but again, I think we can draw on work on social movements and extremist politics to think about, for example, the rise of hate groups and how that's a threat. Small activists who are challenging the basic norms, 
for example, using violence as techniques or domestic terrorism. And then constitutionally, we have things like the Comparative Constitution Project, which looked at the dynamics of, of each institution. So let's think about this case. And the case is obviously the one in the headlines, the one that we're worried about. Donald Trump tweeting, I won the election, and even more, for example, phoning up electoral officials to try to reverse the results in Detroit and other places. What's the nature of the risks? And again, to emphasize, we're living through this. It's difficult to estimate at the time developments are happening, but we can still set out five scenarios, if you like. And the first threat is about the transition. Second is about soft power and democracy abroad. Third is about policy failure and DC gridlock. Fourthly, deepening party polarization. And, and lastly, and most critically, a legitimacy crisis. Now, let's think about each of these risks. Firstly, what about the government? So much of the media commentary has focused on the problems of the practical administrative matters as one administration leads to another. So whether it's staff appointments, funding, access to agencies, that's undoubtedly there. And particularly under the crisis we're through, we're in right now on the pandemic of vaccines and the fact that there's chaos in the White House by most accounts of firings of senior staff, including in the Pentagon, of troop withdrawals being threatened, but really on an ad hoc political basis and so on. Now, all of that is worrying, but really that's about American politics 101. On the other hand, we have President-elect Biden and Harris, an experienced team willing to take over. Many staff from the, Biden from the Obama administration who are seasoned in how to get stuff done. And frankly, Biden is one of the most experienced of anybody of getting legislation through, through the Senate. And of course, the local response to COVID is actually the responsibility of state governors right now and not the federal thing. So what's the risks? Well, a short delay in the transition, if all things go according to plan. It's not critical. The court battles are failing, we know that. And everything we hope will be resolved on the 14th of December when things get, get um, resolved. And so Yasha's view that we can be optimistic on this ground, I think, yes, you know, we're probably going to do politics as usual. Is it ideal? No. Is it disaster? No. But what about the damage to American soft power? And this is diplomacy. And this is about, in particular, the image of America as the advocate of democracy as an ideal, but also through its work through um, UNDP and, and the United Nations and all the international agencies. Clearly, the withdrawal from these has been a long term damage to multilateralism and American leadership diplomatically has been weakened. How can we advocate um, uh, democracy abroad when things are failing or not working effectively at home? And this is a common problem where presidents have tried to retain in office throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. We even give prizes to African presidents who step down voluntarily. It's a problem in South Central Asia. It's a problem in Eastern Europe. Think about Belarus with the major crisis. But this again can be seen as a temporary setback to international relations and to America's role. It can be attributed to Donald Trump as an individual, not necessarily to a systemic crisis of America's position. The United Nations is cutting back, international community is cutting back on funding for the promotion of or strengthening of democracy. But that's happening not just in America. You can see that even in our Nordic colleagues in Sweden and Norway or in Germany or in many other places as attention goes, becomes more domestic. And again, Biden is a well-known international leader. So he's going to repair relationships with the European Union who welcomes his, his incoming administration. He's going to repair things through quick action, which he can do on things like the Paris Climate Accord and again, membership and, and funding of the World Health Organization in the pandemic and so on. So is this a major problem? Well, it's a problem, but again, I think it can be seen as a more temporary dip rather than a long-term problem. Third issue is more significant. What does the lack of transition mean for future gridlock? We've seen under the Obama administration, the problems when the Senate refused to go along. And currently the fact that the GOP leadership almost consistently with a handful of other dissenters has said they've refused even to shake the hand and acknowledge the Biden administration victory is a problem. And what it does is it signals, even though there's an olive branch from Biden saying we should have unity, we need to work together, it signals a lack of the ability of the American system to work together across Congress and in the White House. It signals that much of the legislative agenda that Biden and he got 77 million voters supporting him on this basis is not going to be able to be implemented in practice. And the problems of climate change, racial justice, 
and the pandemic and economic recovery are so fundamental, it needs cooperation to get stuff done. Now, that depends, of course, on the Senate, which we don't know because of Georgia, but nevertheless, it's likely the GOP will hold it. The Democrats will lose some seats in the House and therefore will have lots of executive orders and the role of the courts. So are there areas of potential cooperation for American politics? Yes, of course, infrastructure. Remember that the week of infrastructure that's never happened. CARES too, there has to be some sort of um, resources to give the hospitality industry and others who are temporarily out of work or furloughed real uh, hope. And there has to be some movement, I hope, on DACA. But the big issues, COVID, climate change, can you really see cooperation on major issues? Can you really see cooperation on racial justice? Um, I have my doubts. So in that sense, it's more of the same and the gridlock has been really problematic. And of course, it's deepened party polarization as the fourth risk. Now the fourth risk sounds partisan. It sounds as though we're liberals or we're Democrats and therefore we're complaining about the fact that Biden didn't get uh, both the Senate and the House and the White House. But it isn't that. It's the fact that America has winner take all rules which heightens the risk of uh, any party and it heightens the incentives to bend the rules of the game if you're going to be a minority party, as the Republicans increasingly are in terms of their share of the popular vote, their control of the Senate is through control primarily of the rural bias and the electoral college was still tight because again of rural biases there, which is where they have their strength. So what does this mean? That the crisis isn't just about Trump. Yes, Yasha, it looks likely that eventually Donald Trump will lead the White House, but Trumpism, i.e. authoritarian populism, is not going to fade quietly into the night and disappear. Those who hope that it's about the president and focus on that certainly assume that, I don't. Because the trends happened two, two decades ago. The trends in the fact that the Republican Party no longer accepts the democratic rules of the game are not just Trump. In fact, Trump is as much the um, product as he is the cause of some of these things, although he accelerated it. And what aboutism, i.e. the equal thing, that we have extremists on both sides, we always hear, but it's not true according to most of the evidence. And I'm just going to quickly give you a little evidence before then giving my major concern, which is about culture. And the evidence is from two sources which have just come out. This relates to our research. I've created the Global Party Survey, which looks at 166 countries and over a thousand parties. VDEM has come out with VParty, which is a new data set. What does it show? And here we can bring in our comparative lens to look at America right now in global perspective. And this shows us the two, di two different dimensions of party competition, which was standard, economic values left right going along the horizontal axis, and the social values between liberals and conservatives on the vertical. I presented this in a number of places and it's increasingly the way in our book that we think about party competition. And then on top of that, we have the degree of populism measured through the global party survey which is the red, the red parties versus the greens. Uh, greens being in color, not in terms of nature of the party. Now, what do we see? Quite simply that despite the fact that a two party system should put our parties in America in the center, the moderate getting the median voter, they've become very polarized, but it's not an equal polarization as Norm Ornstein has long argued. The US Democrats are based essentially around most liberal democratic parties about Labour Party, Social Democratic, Socialist, uh, Green Parties, and they're also pluralist. There are a couple of parties on the left which are populist, but not that many. And so the US Democrats, even though they have a progressive wing, which has pulled them to the left and to the liberal side in particular, are still within what you would term mainstream parties across OECD countries or liberal democracies. But look at what's happened to the US Demo uh, Republicans, according to the experts, according to this survey, they are really moved far to the far, what I would term authoritarian populist side of the equation on conservative values, particularly religion, and on right wing economic values. And so they're there, along with the Swiss People's Party, for example, or Likud, or the Alternative for Germany, or Vox in Spain, or many other parties which are highly populist in that in that quadrant. But that's not even the most important problem. We have a, a two party system which has become so polarized that the authoritarian conservatives have really taken over the Republican Party, in my view. The moderates have been driven out. They've resigned, except for a handful. Or those who have come in are even more extreme. Think about candidates who believe in QAnon. 
The progressive left has also moved somewhat towards the liberal side, absolutely, but they still remain pluralist according to the evidence. But here's an even more worrying chart, which isn't about your values on policies, it's about agreement over the rules of the game. This is support for liberal democracy, about again, the global party survey, Across the bottom, we have due favor checks and balances on the executive, a basic principle of any liberal democratic system, or do you want to have strong leaders? And then the vertical is, do you, does the party respect liberal democratic principles, norms and practices, or do they undermine them? And again, this is just expert evidence, but it's kind of very um, influential and shows us what, what I think has been going on. Again, I put a circle around the, the US Democrats, Mainstream, favor checks and balances, normal give and take, uh, you know, uh, uh, basically this, the standards that are, that are there for bargaining, compromise and so on. But the US GOP does not favor checks and balances on the executive and does not favor or seeks to undermine liberal democratic principles. And look where they are. They're right next to Hungarian Philips. They're next to Almost the Golden Dawn in Greece, a party which has just been declared illegal, which is a neo-Nazi fascist party, although I don't call the GOP um, fascist, but nevertheless, they're there with the Party for Law and Justice in Poland, who's just been trying to reduce abortion rights, uh, and many other parties uh, like the AFD in Germany, uh, like the French National Rally, um, uh, like the Party for Freedom in the Netherlands and so on. And even the conservatives are, are moving in that direction. So an enormous gap, not just about policies, right? That's fine. It's about principles. It's about how you govern. And if you can't agree on that, then the democracy is going to be really damaged. And it's not just me and it's not just my survey. Here's the latest V Party survey, which tries to look at this over time. And I've just looked here at the American evidence. Um, do I believe it's credible? Uh, we can question that. It hasn't yet been validated. Nevertheless, their pattern is very similar to mine, but they look at it in time series. The red line being the, the Republicans. How far does the party show a lacking commitment to democratic norms? And you can see that starts according to this evidence from the University of Gothenburg in 2000, and it proceeds and it predates Trump. That's really important. It accelerates with Trump, but look at the gap. How far does the party support pluralism? How far are they committed to free and fair elections, multiple parties, freedom of speech, etc.? And again, we can see in the 70s, a little gap, not much. It accelerates in 1986. It plummets in 2000, partly because of Florida. It goes back up somewhat under Obama, but then it plummets in the current decade. And again, that's before Trump, according to this evidence, and then after Trump. How far does the party even deploy personal attacks? Now, that is a fundamental challenge to everything that uh, Levitsky and Zimblatt has talked about in terms of soft social norms. And according to this, that has worsened for a decade. So I'm arguing that the party leadership in Congress is problematic. I'm just going to finish with the evidence on the culture. And I know we have very little time, right? But I'll just give you a little bit of that from the World Value Survey. So this argument as Sherry mentioned, is about democratic backsliding in the electorate, in society, in the public, and in party supporters, not the party elite. A loss of trust and confidence in institutions, and of course, media bubbles, which exacerbate that, and evidence, let me give you a little bit, what's the evidence which is most persuasive? Well, um, earlier I actually challenged um, Yasha Monk's arguments about the decline of democracy in America, you may remember in the Journal of Democracy Critique, um, and Roberta Foa's article. But I looked today at the updated data and this is the declining support for democracy in America. Now, are the majority of Americans still in favor of democracy? Yes, they say. I'm going to describe various type of institutions. This is the proportion who say it's very or fairly good, of course, but it does go down from the first time it was monitored in the World Value Survey, the 195 period when 90%, nine out of 10, and look at what happens eight out of 10 by 2011 before Trump comes to office. After that, there's a bit of a blip back, but we don't have the period uh, since then. Part of that blip back is amongst Republicans who feel that with the change of government, they could actually support democracy more. But of course, you have to break that down by party. But look at this chart, which is even more worrying. Rising support for authoritarianism. How do we measure that? Quite fascinatingly, most American surveys don't bother to measure it. They just assume we're a democracy. Why do you need to measure it? This is the question, which is very simple, the same framework. 
I'm going to describe various systems. Is it very good or not? This one, having a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with parliament or Congress and elections. And as you can see, a quarter of the Americans agreed with that in 1995 when it was first asked. It goes up in 1999, the second wave, goes up in 2006, goes up in 2011, goes up in 2017. 40% roughly, four out of 10. Don't have to bother with elections, what's the problem? And again, I think that gridlock and that party extremism and the lack of ability for the American system to respond to party problems is at the heart of much of this frustration. You can break it down and it's even worse if you look at it by Republicans versus Democrats. Republicans are more likely to say that they don't really want to have elections. Why bother? They don't want to have Congress because nobody trusts Congress. Uh, you can do this worldwide as I just have done. And again, you can see the problems are even greater, the same indicators. Blue is approval of democracy, red is approval of a strong leader over time. And look at what happens in many of the electoral democracies. A Montenegro, a port support for the strong leader shoots up. Argentina, Peru, Bangladesh, South Korea, South Africa, Turkey, Serbia. Not every country. And still democracy is given more, more confidence than other, but look at how close it is in Ukraine. Look at how close it is in some of the countries where democracy has been faltering and is not working, um, Pakistan, etc. Not in Germany, not in the established um, Western long-standing democracies, but in America, as we've seen, it's gone up, and in many electoral democracies, it's gone up. Confidence in elections has gone down in America, and this is the most recent evidence that really, if you don't trust your elections, then liberal democracy is confidence goes down. This is just the most recent polls after the election. Do you think that mail ballots are manipulated? Trump supporters, overwhelming, absolutely. 10% say no, probably not true. 90% say yeah. Do you think that illegal immigrants voted fraudulently? We know that there's no cases of fraud from all sorts of sources. Trump supporters, yeah, that's probably true. Do you think fraud occurred in this election? 80% of Trump things enough to out, out influence the outcome. So not just at the margins, but enough to delegitimize. I won't go into that. So the conclusions. Is there a deeper crisis? Yes, Yasha's right that we are likely, we, don't, we won't probably see a coup. I mean, that was always an extremist view. And I know some scholars wrote that in various articles and Vox worried about it and so on. But I mean, that's not what it's about. It's about the delegitimization. Why is Trump and his administration and his compliant supporters going along with these claims of fraud when they know they can't win? Because they undermine faith in the system. So of all of these, I think there are in severity of risk order and it's the legitimacy crisis, which I'd emphasize. And it's the cultural aspects, not the institutions. The formal institutions have kind of pushed back. The courts are winning on the, on the they're throwing out the cases without evidence. The media is now coming out and saying these are lies. They're not just weaselly saying, oh, it's not quite true or whatever. Um, there's considerable resilience in the formal institutions, but culturally, if enough Republicans influenced by their leader, influenced by media bubbles, influenced by conspiracy theorists no longer believe that democracy is the best form of government in America, then that's a problem for everyone. And you get essentially this, what is a legitimacy crisis? It's not accepting the rules of the game. And on both sides, when people say that they don't accept my president, then that seems to be dark times for American politics. Can we pull out? Uh, as I said, this is speculative. We're in the middle of this. We don't know what's going to happen on the 14th of December. We don't know what's going to happen, whether we're going to have men in white coats coming to the White House. But it's just it's just bad for so many aspects of how American democracy works. Our policymaking is going to be solved, whether we can get any compromise in the actual public policy, but whether faith in the basic rules of the game and soft norms are seriously under threat. So it's went on such a bad note anyway. Thank you, Thanks, Pippa. Um, all right, so now we are going to, thank you everyone for really fascinating, provocative presentations. Uh, we're going to open it up for uh, comments. If you have a question, please either put in the question and answer or raise your hand. But I think before we 
as people are thinking of their questions, and there's already some questions in the question and answer, I would like to give our panelists an opportunity to respond to any of them. I mean, to any of their co-panelists uh, thoughts. I mean, I th I, just as one thought as people are collecting their thoughts, I mean, I sort of see that Yasha and Sherry both raised this issue, issue of responses to populist authoritarianism. Um, and so it's interesting to think about what the various options are that are on the table. Um, um, you know, on that regard, I think that, you know, there's a longstanding debate, for instance, in Germany about the kind of concept of a militant democracy where parties can be banned, free speech can be limited. Uh, this is something that is, you know, often not even considered in the American context. You know, is this something that should be considered? Or is this even a possible possibility? So that this is one thought. Um, uh, in terms of Wolfgang and Pippa's uh, comments, I mean, it's striking to me that, you know, Wolfgang worries about the philosopher king of scientists and science in the German context. I think in an American, I mean, what's so shocking and star startling about this critique, which I think is a fascinating one, is in the American context, we can't even get, you know, the, we don't, we want science to even be at the table, let alone worrying about it being a philosopher king. So the kind of, the, so I, I'm curious what Wolfgang's perspective is on the American situation. So these concerns that he raised, does he also see this as a threat in the United States or are we facing a different kind of challenge? Is this a particularly European? Uh, so that there's a bit of a disjuncture, I think, between the American context that Pippa described where we, we don't even accept the results of elections versus a kind of hyper-rationalized uh, response to kind of basic existential threats. Um, so we have questions, but I, I wanna first give our panelists an opportunity to respond to anything particular that one of your co-panelists said. We have about 20 minutes left though, so we'll kind of keep our comments brief. So, so, so um, Sherry, maybe beginning with Sherry, if you, since we'll go in the order um, of people. Okay, yeah. well, look, I mean, I think there's two, there's two sort of dichotomies that were raised by my fellow panelists and maybe by you, Dan, that might be worth thinking about. I mean, the first is the question about norms and institutions. I would say sort of hooking up with some things that Yasha and Pippa said that, the Trump case is really interesting and critical, right? And so what I think Trump's, um, I think what the election has shown is how very far democratic norms have decayed, particularly within the Republican party. I mean, it's really quite astonishing, right? Every, every possible norm has been pushed or blown by, I think, questioning elections, questioning the legitimacy of your opponents, outright lying, firing people, you name it, it's, it's there. But I think the institutions have proven to be quite resilient. And so there really is a push and pull, I think, that's going on between the election and January 20th, um, um, you know, between the fact that we've seen serious democratic norm erosion, but the institutions seem able perhaps to hold and make sure that there is a peaceful transition. Um, political scientists who study institutions would predict that. I think institutions are supposed to precisely be that. They're supposed to, you know, be able to have a staying power beyond the original conditions that gave rise to them. Then this question of technocracy, I take the Wolfgang point of technocracy versus democracy. Finding the right balance there is critical, right? Either a shift in too far in either direction is deadly for democracy. A democracy that ignores expertise, that ignores, um, you know, sort of limits on it is very dangerous. A democracy, uh, you know, a technocracy where democratic influences have been denigrated, where experts rule over the whims of the people, that is also bad. And so I think the problem is really finding the right balance. And perhaps it's gone a little bit too far um, in one direction in the US. And perhaps the threat Wolfgang fears is that it's gone too far in the other direction in Europe. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, what about you, Yasha? Um, oh, Wolfgang, yeah. Wolfgang, you're Wolfgang next. Wolfgang. So okay. Sherry, uh, Sherry has already responded to a large extent, so uh, it would be very comfortable for me just uh, to say Sherry is right. Uh, what, I, what I want to say, by the way, Sherry, uh, but what I have observed in Europe is uh, the following. There is a strong belief in science and policy sciences now for almost a decade are uh, propagating there must be a kind of evidence-based policy. And evidence is produced by science, not by democratic rules, not by democratic norms. And what worries me to some extent is what happens if we have clear scientific evidence, but we have rules, 
which prohibits or which limits an effective response uh, to the crisis or in an effective way to implement these scientific knowledge. Then we would argue as demo, from a democratic point of view, it must be uh, the democratic norms who decide and the rules, what kind of policy governments have to follow. And what happens if they follow not the scientific knowledge? And this will drive a new or deepen the cleavage between, let's say, the well-educated, reasonable people on the one side, and so to say, those people who become a kind of victim of populist propaganda. And uh, what you have seen in the United States is a complete different model of of governing. It was not governing by rational fear. It was saying there is no risk at all. There is no danger. And this is the populist, so to say, response. But you can do this only one time or two times. Trump could not have repeated again, or even not Bolsonaro. Probably they would have gotten response by uh, the voters. I have one point to Pit Pippa, which certainly is something we have uh, to look uh, closer. Which are the most effective and powerful agent for democratic resilience? I have not heard a word, uh, Pippa, uh, and you certainly have an opinion on that, about the role of the courts. In Europe, and especially in Germany, the uh, courts played an important role for protecting the hardware of democracy against the government. There were more than 100 rulings by the courts which uh, 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 banned the uh, decisions by the government. And they played, so to say, an important role of the democratic protection. What is in the United States? So uh, hand it over to Yasha, but before I do, uh, Wolfgang, I mean, you say that they, Trump can't do this again, but you know, in a certain way with climate change, we have this as an ongoing issue where there's a way in which the denial of that, there's no reason to be fearful. This is not really a problem. We'll see this issue resurrect itself once again. And in a certain way, I think as what you're suggesting is that these three issues, immigration, climate change, pandemics are created for our, our work to the benefit of pop, populists. And so that the, this is a dangerous terrain, in fact. And I think they can go, go, go back to the well more than just one time. Uh, Yasha. So I just want to say briefly that this is a, a wonderful, lively debate. And I think it builds very, very well for the idea of this joint seminar. So I'm excited for the next sessions. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, brief responses. I mean, uh, first of all, I just want to thank Pippa for what I take to be her uh, sort of very gracious uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, con con conceding um, uh, in our long-running debate about the relevance of uh, some of the shifts in public opinion that uh, there really has been uh, some significant deterioration in support for, for liberal democracy in the United States and some other countries, and that does help illuminate the situation. So, so thank you for that. I actually agree with Pippa strongly on the long-term legitimacy uh, problem uh, that is of long standing, right? I mean, in 2000, Democrats uh, thought that George W. Bush was illegitimately elected. In 2008, Republicans thought that Barack Obama was illegitimate, not so much because the election was somehow uh, fraudulent or, or contested, but because he was supposedly born in Kenya. Um, uh, now, of course, in 2016, Democrats argued that Trump had been uh, elected with Russian help and interference. And, and, and now it looks like a majority of Republicans will think that there was sort of something fraudulent about the election. I don't think that those, I mean, I, you know, I think some of those claims were better founded than others. So I'm not saying that this is all the same, but it's been the case for a while now that, that, that a l large number, not a majority, but a large number of Americans think, hey, if the president comes from the other side, he's illegitimate. And I don't see any indications of that letting up anytime soon. And, and I think that's absolutely something to be worried about uh, in a serious way. And, and the president going so far as to say, not just, oh, there was a little bit of interference or there's these weird hanging chads or uh, whatever, but saying, you know, the actual election count was significantly fraudulent. It's obviously an escalation of that. And, 
-hmm. that's going to have long-term impacts. I, I, I agree with that. I think that's a point that's worth under, un, underlining. I am um, not more optimistic than most about the future of the Republican Party, but I would say that I'm more agnostic about it than most. Uh, I think the, the, the range of outcomes uh, is wider than most people think at the moment. There's, there's a few reasons for that. I mean, one is just sort of a tactical point. I do think that in a situation in which we're deeply polarized, we should be very careful about relying on assessment measures which are themselves produced by players who are part of the polarized dynamic. So I think the sort of, you know, you go to experts and ask them how they feel about the Republican Party, and those experts are sort of five political scientists in the United States, as, as I understand the case with Vida, uh, is not great sort of, and obviously Pippa didn't particularly or, or especially rely on that, but, but it's just a way of doing political science that I think we should be wary of. Um, now, I think Norm Ornstein has shown very strongly why there is um, uh, uh, polarization, which is much more strong among the Republican Party and Democratic Party by relying on facts and actual things they do and particular mm -hmm. policy positions they take. But, but I do think we should be self-critical about the fact that we are all on the same side of this polarized divide. And that means that we as social scientists are just as tempted as other citizens to overemphasize uh, what's good about our size and overemphasize what's bad about the other side. Now, I'm still part of that and I still think that, right? But, but I just think we need to be a little bit careful. But the second point is about the long-term development of the Republican Party. I mean, uh, look, the presidential candidates that the party chose are very different from each other. Uh, you know, John McCain was very different from George W. Bush and Mitt Romney was very different from John McCain and Donald Trump is very different from, from the other three. Uh, and for whatever things you can blame John McCain and Mitt Romney for, uh, and for I was not yet an American citizen, I certainly wouldn't have voted for them at the time, uh, I think it's undoubtedly true that those two flag bearers of the GOP had a much deeper commitment to democracy than Donald Trump does. And that uh, for whatever damage they too may have done, uh, you know, they did accept the basic elements of liberal democracy. So, you know, let's see who wins in 2024 in the Democratic and the Republican primaries. Um, uh, it's absolutely imaginable that it's going to be Donald Trump. It's absolutely imaginable that it's going to be Don Trump Jr. Uh, it's absolutely imaginable that it's somebody like Tom Cotton or Tucker Carlson. Absolutely. It could also be a surprise. It could be a more traditional Republican candidate like Marco Rubio, or it could be a declared moderate like one of the blue state governors who are Republican. I just don't want to rule that out. I think there's sort of, our, our confidence interval here should be very, very wide. Uh, the last very brief point that we haven't mentioned is that one really good piece uh, of news from this election that we haven't mentioned is about demography. I think there's plenty of crazy ideas that a lot of people on the right in American politics believe. There's a good number of crazy ideas that a lot of people on the left in American politics believe. There's few crazy ideas that a lot of serious people on both sides believe. And one of those is the idea of a rising demographic majority, which will, uh, you know, automatically and, and, and with huge likelihood just help Democrats win election after election over the next 30 years. And I think it's a dangerous misconception because it drives a form of triumphalism on the left, which means we don't really have to persuade anybody and we can just wait for all these old white people to die out and then the country will finally be better, which is not exactly a way of making civic peace. And it definitely drives the craziness on the right. As you know, if you read something like Michael Anton's Flight 93 essay, which basically says, all these terrible people are taking over, it's now or never, so we should be willing to do anything in order to keep them out, right? Um, well, in this election, we've seen Joe Biden make huge inroads among white voters and older voters. And we've seen uh, actually moves among a few black people, fewer, but still significant, um, a large number of Latinos, a large number of Muslim Americans, less, less remarked on, towards the Republican Party. Now, I think in itself, it's worrying because anybody who votes for Donald Trump, uh, in my mind, is, is, is enabling somebody who's quite dangerous to democracy. But in the long run, I think this is a good thing. If the American electorate is depolarizing by race, uh, that is good news for the future of America. And it may be a harbinger at some point of, 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 of a less uh, nasty polarized political system as well. 
So thank you, Yasha. We only have like seven minutes left and there's a bunch of questions and I wanna give Pippa an answer to say something too, but let me just put two other questions on the table from the question and answer thing and so that maybe we'll have time and it did. So Pippa, if you could keep your answer somewhat brief so that others can also have a offered a, an opportunity to answer these questions. One from Hans Jürgen Pula, uh, how could the specifically vulnerable cultural and behavioral dimensions of Pippa's democratic backlash be better addressed? Yeah, suggest what about education and civil society activation? And then another fascinating question, a healthy democracy needs a certain level of polarization and healthy political flight, yet extreme polarization can kill democracies. Has the how has the scholarship performed in establishing criteria to identify what is a healthy level of polarization and essentially what is an unhealthy level of polarization? I think that last question is particularly interesting. So Pip, if you could give some comments and then we'll maybe have a last several minutes for the last, for the other panels. So very briefly, uh, just taking those questions backwards as it were, polarization is fine. It's opportunities and choice. It's disastrous in a two party system because then it's a winner take all, particularly when you have a plurality who can get in through a third of the vote or 40% and therefore the majority feel they're unrepresented. So it's the rules of the game plus polarization is the problem, not polarization. If you're in a multi-party system, as in Germany, having the AFD is fine, you're having the communists are fine and having the Greens are fine, because that's just a choice on the ballot, right? Um, vulnerable, how do we actually deal with democratic breakdown? I must admit, this is the most problematic issue, which I really don't think we have a good handle on. We have ideas, suggestions, but we have no systematic way of really thinking about that. I can give you some suggestions, but they're kind of speculative. And let me just briefly mention Wolfgang. Germany, strong belief in science, absolutely. Strong belief in the courts, absolutely. There's a nice study which has come out from the political economists looking at populists and their response to COVID. When they're in power, when they're in government, how did they respond compared with governments that were more pluralist or traditional, mainstream? What they found was that the populists basically used magical thinking. They were slower to respond in March to actually uh, bring in some of the key issues like PPE on general across various countries. And then they were uh, more difficult, they had more, less restrictions in April uh, in things like lockdowns and stuff like that. So a Bolsonaro, a Modi, a Trump, a um, Johnson, I mean, we can mention all sorts of populist leaders, but they really did have a different view and magical thinking was dominant. In, in Modi, you had to bang pots and pans on the roof and that was meant to get rid of COVID. I mean, you know, this is not what we term anything rational or whatever. And of course, as I've mentioned, the bleach solution is equally problematic. Um, the last quick point on, on Yasha, I'm glad to concede, but it's not to concede totally, but to say that we all look at the evidence. If the evidence changes, then our views should change and our interpretations should change. And we've got a new wave of World Value Survey, which I can just announce has just been released in conjunction with the European Value Survey, 78 countries in the pooled data set, over 100 in the con continuous one. And they do show a shift, I think. So it's in, 90, in the early 90s, in the mid 90s, it was more ambiguous, but now it's become much more evident. And so we can definitely say that cultural values have shifted um, in that regard. And, and the last quick, quick question, demography, is it a cause of hope or a cause of fear? It's both, because in other words, I don't believe that evidence on racial um, closure in the last election. If I look at the Edison election poll, if I look at the NORC vote cast, then there's very great differences to the aggregate. And the aggregate is coming in for real criticism at the county level because of all sorts of issues about interactions and so on and endogenous policies. And I think that it's a risk because the GOP know that they're on a, a shrinking vote. They know that they're dependent upon rural states and certain older white male populations still, despite any small closure, if there has been one amongst Cuban Hispanics. And so, that means they're more likely to challenge the rules of the game and to try to make sure that their, their interests, in other words, they're, they're, the future of their party is on the line now, right? And that means you're going to be more desperate, which means you're more likely to challenge cooperation, conciliation, giving any ground at all or credit to Joe Biden uh, for anything, basically. So it may as worse as much as better. That was my quick. So we have three minutes left, so maybe I'll leave the table to one of the four of you if you want to say, have any pressing issues that we need to get on to this agenda before we all disappear into the ether. Wolfgang. Can I say a word on yes, polarization? Yes, please, Wolfgang. Uh, there are different forms of polarization. It's not only a matter of, uh, of quantity. It's a matter what drives uh, polarization. And for a socioeconomic polarization, democracy has developed during the 20th century 
uh, a set of instrument and tools, tax policy, wage policy, welfare state policy. And I don't see an, any uh, equivalent tool for dealing with cultural uh, polarization. It's a matter of exclusion and not a matter of degree. And this makes the situation and the polarization in our society more riskier than class cleavages, which have been domesticated to some extent uh, by democratic means. Yeah. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, Jegos. Yeah, just very quick, quick point. Uh, uh, we've been traveling analytically uh, uh, in the terrain like a triangle, right? Public opinion on the one side, then institutions, then political parties. Uh, I think we should pay more attention to uh, what is going on in, inside the triangle. Uh, so I'm going back to Yasha's point about civil society. What, what we are seeing in many places uh, are two separate civil societies. And the question is how they are organized, uh, so a liberal one and anti-liberal one, what is their logic and, and how this can affect the resilience of democracy? I think this is an important issue. Uh, and uh, you know, Sherry started that discussion many, many years ago, uh, but we didn't follow uh, you know, uh, in, in sort of good way uh, to think about those issues. Great, thank you, Jagorsh. So we're, we're out of time. There's lots of questions that remain. Somebody, the very last question that somebody asks is, when will your next session in the symposium be? And that's one I can answer. I think it's some, some point in December is what we're hoping. So we'll, we'll hope to have a quick turnaround and continue with this. The state of democracy uh, in the world may not be great, but the state of our studies of democracy as demonstrated by this panel, quite rich, lots of questions still to be answered. Lots of new issues. I think Wolfgang brought to the table a whole set of new issues that have come onto the agenda. And so I think we'll have a lot more to talk about. So thank, join me in thanking uh, the panelists, Yasha, Sherry, Wolfgang, Pippa. Thank you, Jay Gorsh, as well. Um, and see you all next time. You'll be hearing from us soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Nice to talk. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.